Hello and welcome to the Markets, Trends and Profits channel. Today we'll discuss the recent events in Afghanistan, why their implications are absolutely huge and what social, political and economic consequences we could expect from this episode. I also want to point out that this report is quite critical of the British foreign policy establishment, but this criticism is not aimed at the British people any more than I would be uh, critical of Italy or Italian people by criticizing the Italian mafia. With that, let's get into today's matter. Former Fed Chairman Arthur Burns said that a subtle understanding of economic change comes from a knowledge of history and large affairs, not from statistics or their processing alone. So far as large affairs go, the recent event in Afghanistan could hardly be any larger. On Sunday, 15 August, Taliban fighters entered Kabul unopposed and Afghan President Ashraf Ghani fled the country. Two days later, the Afghanistan Central Bank Chief Ajmal Ahmadi did the same. The events took almost everyone by surprise and the foreign policy establishments in the US and the UK were extremely vexed about it all. The loss of Afghanistan was not just a small setback. The empire's ability to hang on to Afghanistan was the centerpiece of its Eurasia policy and the events that we just witnessed will have very far-reaching repercussions. How important was Afghanistan? It was pivotal. Historian Ramsey McMullen suggested that in order for us to interpret history correctly, we must understand the motivations of groups and individuals who created history. Today's empire builders are motivated by the overarching imperative to maintain hegemony over the Eurasian landmass. Sir Halford Mackinder explicitly formulated this ambition in 1904 in his Heartland Theory. He referred to the Eurasian continent as World Island. In Democratic Ideals and Reality, he wrote as follows. Who rules East Europe commands the heartland, who rules the heartland commands the world island, and who rules the world island controls the world. In the aftermath of World War I, the empire moved like a parasite to infiltrate the United States, co-opt its economic and military might, and make it its own battering ram to subjugate other nations. In the process, it has made its own policy objectives American policies. Empire's court intellectual Zbigniew Brzezinski articulated these objectives as America's own, and explain their importance. For America, the chief geopolitical price is Eurasia. Eurasia is the globe's largest continent and is geopolitically axial. A power that dominates Eurasia would control two of the world's three most advanced and economically productive regions. About 75% of the world's people live in Eurasia and most of the world's physical wealth is there as well, both in its enterprises and underneath its soil. Eurasia accounts for 60% of the world's GDP and about three quarters of the world's known energy resources. The same imperial obsession was reaffirmed again in August of 2018 in a briefing to the US Senate Foreign Relations Committee by Wes Mitchell, the Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs. Mitchell made it explicit that the central aim of the administration's foreign policy is to defend U.S. domination of Eurasian landmass as the foremost U.S. national security interest and to prepare the nation for this challenge. Mitchell also said that the administration was working with our close ally, the U.K., to form an international coalition for coordinating efforts in this field. So the loss of Afghanistan will prove to be a huge setback to the empire builder's imperative goal of dominating the Eurasian continent. That explains the avalanche of furious reactions from London establishment, which is still the empire's intellectual and ideological headquarters. Britain's defense secretary, Ben Wallace, broke down in tears speaking about the evacuation of those people whom we have obligations to. At the House of Commons, MP Tom Tugginhut gave a theatrically emotional speech saying that this last week has been one that has seen me struggle through anger and grief and rage and so on. Former Prime Minister Theresa May waxed lyrical about the commitment and dedication of our armed forces who were all doing what they could to give hope to the people of Afghanistan who enjoyed their freedoms thanks to our presence there. Ms. May also condemned the American administration's unilateral decision to make a deal with the Taliban without first consulting the UK government. In a London Times article published on 23rd August, Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab is quoted as denouncing American isolationism, adding that America has just signaled to the world that they are not that keen on playing a global role. The implications of that are absolutely huge. We are going to have to do a hard-nosed revisit on all our assumptions and policies. For the offense of dropping Afghanistan for them, 
In spite of strenuous warnings to Washington from Her Majesty's government, Mr. Rabb was incensed enough to drop the diplomatic decorum and resort to insults. The US had to be dragged kicking and screaming into the First World War. They turned up late for the Second World War, and now they're cutting and running in Afghanistan. Former Prime Minister Tony Blair said that the US withdrawal did not have to be done, and it was done in obedience to an imbecilic political slogan about ending the forever wars. Mr. Blair's statements, in fact, revealed what the loss of Afghanistan is all about for the empire, or global Britain, as it has been recently rebranded. We are at risk of relegation to the second division of global powers. Indeed, empires do not go quietly into the night, and reactions and contingency plans were considered with some urgency in British halls of power. Daily Mail dramatically announced that across Whitehall and in British embassies around the world, Officials and diplomats are adjusting to the fact that Mr. Biden has adopted an America first policy every bit as isolationist as his predecessors. What ensued was a multi-pronged scramble to stir the Afghan pot again disguised as a rescue mission. British government deployed 900 elite paratroopers and the soldiers were told to expect face-to-face -face combat with the Taliban. They were also instructed to watch the Americans in case they leave, because without the 6,000 US troops on the ground, the Brits could easily be overwhelmed. But in addition to fighting terrorism, the empire has also strong humanitarian reasons not to let go of Afghanistan. In a well-coordinated campaign, corporate media has provided a suitable narrative to accompany the ongoing British rescue operation. Suddenly, we have a deluge of articles about how terrible the Taliban are, and how the American troops are hardly any better. How the people in Afghanistan, and especially women and girls, as almost every article emphasizes, are terrified and desperate. And how heroic, compassionate, and wonderful the British soldiers are. But where was all this compassion and wonderfulness for the last 20 years? Where were the heroic rescue missions when 4 million displaced Afghans who fled fighting were abandoned to starvation, sickness, and death in makeshift shelters, as Amnesty International recently reported? Where was the compassion about the child hunger, which has been among the worst in the world? Where was the outrage that under empire's occupation, 55% of Afghan children suffered irreversible harm from malnutrition? Where was the anger, grief, and rage about the relentless drone strikes that killed 90% innocent bystanders and 40% children? Only the most deluded consumers of the mainstream narrative have by now failed to understand that the empire is not and never has been about democracy, freedoms, or the subjugated people's rights. The empire is about conquest, control, resources, including the cheap labor force coerced from the local populations. It's about collateral and about ruthless extraction of wealth. To organize and manage the plunder, the empire recruits local collaborators and incentivizes them with a share of the loot. In this way, the empire sponsors a vast network of deeply corrupt officials and provides them with power and protection. Journalist Matt Taibbi recently reviewed a report by the Special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction, who probed approximately $63 billion disbursed in Afghanistan. They found that about $19 billion, fully 30% of the allocated funds, was lost to waste, fraud and abuse. Of course, the $63 billion were only the tip of the iceberg of the industrial-scaled corruption that has immiserated life in Afghanistan for the two decades. The full cost of the 20-year occupation of Afghanistan was estimated at $2.3 trillion according to the new figures published by the Brown University Cost of War Project. Some staggering details of this abuse were already detailed in the December 2019 in the Afghanistan Papers Exposé. In 2010, U.S. diplomatic cable released by WikiLeaks quoted the Afghan National Security Advisor saying that corruption is not just a problem for the system of governance in Afghanistan, it is the system of governance. The toxic effect of corruption in the Afghan society was not unknown to the empire builders. As U.S. Special Envoy Richard Holbrook noted almost at the outset, the corruption was destroying the efforts to create a viable democracy. Indeed, he said corruption was Taliban's number one recruiting tool. The loss of Afghanistan not only stops the gravy train out of that nation, it also jeopardizes the empire's hegemony over the coveted Eurasian world island and ultimately everywhere else. The spectacle of the Afghan president and central bank chiefs scrambling to flee the country with bags of cash reveals the dying empire's inability to prop up and protect its servants. 
Afghan President Ghani fled to Tajikistan but was not allowed to stay there. Allegedly, he then sought refuge in Uzbekistan but was turned away again before fleeing to the United Arab Emirates. The episode and all its implications will not be lost on the multitude of the Empire's other servants. Will the corrupt puppets in the Middle East, Africa, South America and elsewhere be comfortable following the Empire's dictates? Will they obediently build back better, plowing over their economies and social fabric and destroying their people's lives? After Afghanistan, they will have to think about making nice with their own people and seek cooperation with other global powers, primarily China and Russia. The empire has already been checkmated in Ukraine. It lost Syria and its hold on Iraq has all but slipped away. Afghanistan may well prove to be its death wound. Through history, empires have almost invariably been sordid business. As Tacitus wrote, they plunder, they butcher, they ravish, and they call it by the lying name of empire. They make a desert and call it peace. So if today's empire has been mortally wounded, and I believe it has, then good riddance. Afghan rescue missions will have to wrap up by 31 August deadline. After that date, all foreign troops must leave Afghanistan. But the empire was not a party to the American administration's deal with the Taliban, and it is all but certain that it will seek to sabotage it and hold on to Afghanistan by hook or by crook. On cue, only 11 days after the Taliban takeover, ISIS, and allegedly its K variant, emerged out of nowhere to stage a terror attack at Kabul airport, killing at least 103 people, including 13 American soldiers and 28 Taliban fighters. The very next day, former head of the CIA and President Obama's defense secretary, Leon Panetta, went on CNN to claim that the US troops would have to go back into combat in Afghanistan to wage the endless war on terror, of course. We can expect the media and other swamp creatures to amplify this message over the coming weeks. ISIS can be expected to provide further elements of persuasion for any hesitant policymakers in the West. Remember, ISIS, which only had marginal presence in Afghanistan since 2014, is the creation of the rogue elements of the Western intelligence agencies and has always faithfully aligned its terrorist activities with the empire's agenda in the Middle East and North Africa. Our next question is, what could be the economic impact of the events in Afghanistan? Without a doubt, the consequences will prove far-reaching over the long run, but in the short and medium term, volatility is about all we can predict. Ultimately, the uncertainty will exacerbate the already acute economic crisis in the West, primarily in the guise of higher interest rates, which in turn affect pretty much everything else. One of the casualties could be the still inflating asset bubble. Quantitative easing and financial repression through artificially low interest rates is how we got that bubble in the first place. High interest rates could be the sharp object moving in the direction of that bubble. Furthermore, commodity prices will likely move significantly higher, putting upward pressure on inflation. In fact, even without Afghanistan, commodity prices have been relatively depressed compared to other assets reaching all-time lows relative to equities. Namely, there's a great deal of liquidity, some $200 trillion worth in the shadow banking system, which might at some point start spilling over into commodities and fuel the anticipated commodity super cycle, which could define the next 10 to 25 years in the markets. While nobody can predict the timing or magnitude of these events, the one thing we know for sure is that large scale price events invariably unfold as trends, which can span many years. The most reliable way to navigate the coming turbulence will be through high quality trend following strategies. This is precisely the kind of decision support we offer with daily iSystem trend compass reports that deliver reliable trend following signals on more than 200 different financial and commodities markets. Monthly subscription rates start at 100 euros and one month test drive is always free of charge. For more information about iSystem trend following and about the Trend Compass reports, please visit our website at iSystem-TF.com. With that, I'll conclude today's report. In my next report, I'll discuss why I think that gold and silver prices could surprise very substantially over the coming months, an analysis that you won't hear elsewhere. To make sure you don't miss it, please subscribe to the channel and give this video a thumbs up. Until then, keep well, stay free, and I will see you soon.